the schools, uh, arrange for um, uh, the payment of their homes, uh, uh, get out of their jobs and get in retirement, they're in trouble. And they're in trouble not because we don't know what to do. You talk about uh, energy reform, you talk about various other kinds of reforms or infrastructure. We know what to do. I've never met anybody who said he's against infrastructure. Everybody I speak to in Washington said, yeah, infrastructure is the number one issue of the country. But they're incapacitated by the fact that in order to solve that problem, we have to increase the debt. We have to pay for it. It's interesting to note this country has never paid for the Louisiana Purchase. We never paid for uh, the Purchase of Alaska. We never paid the Triborough, for the Triborough Bridge. We continue to roll it over. Our debt has been increasing. There have been a few years in our history in which we have been debt free or debt neutral. Very few years. We continue to increase our debt. We're incapacitated by that issue. I challenge anybody to say that 7% of our GDP in terms of national deficit, national expenditure, is too much. I challenge that. Who said it was 7%? Why isn't it 8%? Why isn't it 9%? Why do we stop at 7 I challenge people who say that 100% of our GDP is as much as we can afford in our total nation a national debt. Who said that? The United States is not Greece. The United States is not California. We are the most unique country in the world, and the whole world understands that, and that's why they buy our bonds. We're the safest place to have investment. That's why they buy our bonds, not because they're trying to help us. There is nothing beneficial in the French attitude, believe me. The French don't like us, they don't like anybody. There's nothing beneficial about the Chinese. They do business with us because it's in their interest to do business with us. We should not forget who we are. Our technology is the greatest in the world, and it will continue to be the greatest in the world. Our investment in our technology in information services, in health services, oceanography, aerospace, and uh, uh, a discipline after discipline. The people in the world send their children to our uh, uh, higher education. When they're very sick, the rich people come here. There's something very unique about this country, but what we're missing is leadership. And the leadership starts here. You people are not doing, we are not doing what we should be doing. We should be saying to our uh, representatives, I'm not going to support you because you don't make any difference. I want you to go out there and say to the deficit hawks, we're going to defeat you. We're going to make investments in what is, makes America strong. That's what we need today. <clears throat> Pardon me. And. Um, we are bound by, I understand why it's good to have an energy program, but you're talking about something that's going to benefit from America for 50 years, it'll take us four, five, six years to get there. Um, what we have to say to the deficit hawks, hawks, I don't care if we have a trillion dollar program that increases our debt. We can manage that in America. We cannot ima uh, manage uh, 14, 15, 16 people unemployed. So. To answer your question, um, I'm optimistic that we can do this, but I really believe that what we're missing today is a political leadership that says, this is what we're going to do. I'd just like to say a couple of things. The, the, if we took a poll, and I hate polls, if we took a reading of the people in this <coughs> audience of who the good presidents are, you're going to mention Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman and and John Kennedy, uh, those presidents, every one of them, took unpopular stands to do particular situations, whatever they thought was important. That's missing today in our political equation. If we do not have a definition of what our politics in the next, but between here and November, I would predict 
as optimistic as I am, that we are going to go into a political crisis in which the political floundering of our administration will be reflected throughout the world, and we're going to have a very bad economic situation for several years. Rob, would you like to talk a little bit about the political reality? Yeah. Uh, I think it's important to start from the vantage point of the businessman. Because in a decentralized market economy, it is the businessman that controls hiring, and it's the businessman that controls whether to invest or not. And sustainable consumption derives from the, the decisions the businessman makes. Particularly when I talk to small or medium-sized businessmen who cannot feed off of the state, they're very concerned right now because they say, if you continue to run these deficits without any noticeable increase in social productivity, it will lead to confiscatory, confiscatory taxation in the future and my profits will be diminished. On the other hand, if you cut spending now, if you follow the Niall Ferguson uh, anxiety trajectory, <coughs> I already have excess capacity. How did you work 2008 to elect the president? And how hard did you work 2009 to support him? And most people, it's a pretty big delta. Uh, you know, people went from knocking on doors and running all over the country to you know, munching popcorn and watching TV, you know, ask, what was, well, when's he going to give another speech? And I think that there's a, a, a democracy engagement gap that we've got, got to deal with, number one. Number two, uh, I agree with you that the start-stop nature of a lot of these policies, the, the short-term nature, is just devastating. Uh, we've got to have a long-term uh, uh, engagement. Even in the clean energy sector, you have uh, start-stop tax incentives where people, you can't, uh, you don't know if you're going to have the tax credits in, in two years, literally in two years, to finish your clean energy project. That's nuts. So that, those are the ways we're shooting ourselves in the foot. But I just want to point out that to this point around the deficit, and we can't spend any, any more money, I feel like I woke up in Malawi. I mean, is this, do we live in Malawi? Do we live in like some third world country? It's unbelievable to me that we are, have now talked, our, we've hypnotized ourselves and talked ourselves into this worldview of extreme scarcity so that we're willing to let uh, our classroom sizes double in cities across, double from already 20 kids to 40 kids, uh, 45 kids in schools across the country starting in the fall. You're talking about eating your seed corn. I mean, can you imagine what that's gonna mean uh, for, for, for the long term? There are places in our economy where there's plenty of money. Our big oil companies are still getting billions of dollars of subsidies for reasons that are unclear to most people. Uh, those could be redeployed. Um, we have military contractors who are hiding behind our soldiers' sacrifices and enriching themselves and gorging themselves day after day. They should be at the table uh, in terms of where we're going to be able to get money from. Uh, I'm still confused. I'm not as, as enlightened as, as many of you here as to why these, these banksters have so much of our money and won't lend it out. Um, for, for, in my neighborhood, if you had somebody like these banksters who one year were broke, absolutely busted broke, and then went door to door to every neighbor and got money, which is what the banksters did. We had to bail them out because they mismanaged their affairs. They're in trouble. Now they're fine. They're throwing a party at the end of the block. They've got, you know, uh, every, every imaginable, you know, thing going on. And now it's our turn. It's for the turn them to bail us out. And I think most Americans are absolutely outraged by the fact that we're still getting jacked up on the credit cards, that people are still getting thrown out of their homes, that our kids still can't get student loans, that our bosses can't get bridge loans, and yet the bankers don't have their money, they have our money. So until we're willing to talk about where the real money is in American society and how we actually use the real money in American society to solve the real problems of the American people, I think we are headed for a political disaster. One of the things that you do see regarding savings right now in the United States is that people no longer believe they're getting their savings through real estate wealth accumulation. As a result, the behavior that we are seeing in the data of savings out of income has gone way, way up. In the, I mean, the savings investment balance of the household sector is 
uh, roughly eight or nine percent now from a minus one and a half. So I think there are very, very profound changes. You can see changes in things like deductibility of interest and other things to discourage debt that would improve net savings. There are some policy measures you could undertake. A little bit on this question of Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh validates people's anxieties. People who act in a kind of elite manner don't acknowledge those anxieties in a large portion of the population that Ariana Huffington's writing about in her new book, which is entitled Third World America, don't feel they get any affirmation or voice about their anxieties. When I see David Axelrod last week in the New York Times, when the economics team of the Obama administration is painting pictures very similar, Christina Romer, Larry Summers, and so forth, are painting pictures very similar to what you hear on this panel. And Axelrod and Rahm Emanuel are standing up as the political guys on the record and saying, the polls say people are worried. You have what Bernard referred to as a lack of leadership. We are pandering to the state of fear rather than leading us out of fear. And Lush Limbaugh is, a, is an obstacle to that process. Let me move to Van Rob to answer. <clears throat> you, you asked ask how we could have some, uh, something visible uh, out of the energy uh, policy. I think, uh, to keep it brief, the most visible success of an energy policy will be when people can see their energy bills going down. Uh, often, the, when we talk about uh, green stuff, people think you're going to have to spend more money as opposed to save more money and earn more money. And so, uh, besides all the solar farms and the wind turbines and all, all that kind of stuff, and people going to work with green hard hats, people actually seeing every month their own energy bills going down, their gas bills be, being less rather than more. That's the success we should be driving toward. Bernard, you may have addressed the question earlier, but... I'll try to do it quickly. I'm a little bit intimidated by the questioner and his wife, who spend their whole life on the economic and political side of this country and do an enormously effective job. So what? <laughs> the system is broken. <clears throat> That's the problem. And we need a national leader to fix that system. Now, when, <clears throat> now, when you say uh, the people in Washington are concerned about the problems we're talking about, Larry Summers and Geithner, et cetera, they are the problem. And it, they're the same group who were there for the last 10 years, the same group, OK? Not one person challenges their ability, and nobody in the administration challenges their attitude that debt must be handled, we must avoid, like the play, any increase.